accessible media from Florida Trooper Camp. Abide by our code of conduct, like Mike said. If you have an incident, email um, info at drupalcamp.org. And then he had a phone number, which I forgot to update on the slides. So that's my fault. <coughs> Jordana and Mike and JD. Come to Contribution Day. It's fun. There's pizza and um, people. It's really nice. Um, my name is Amy Jean Heinlein, and I am the open source community ambassador for Canopy Studios. I help organize and mentor at local and regional and national camps, not just in the Drupal space, but in the WordPress space, because I'm a firm believer of open source. If we take it, we need to give back. Um, I'm a hospice nurse by trade, so when I got into tech and I sort of figured out that people could make accessible websites and then they don't, it was kind of a weird thing for me, so that's what got me into accessibility, was like, wow, maybe it's education, maybe it's empathy, you know? So anyway, so that's how I got into the accessibility. I help organize and market Ally Talks, which is A111TLKS, where we have speakers come on every month and talk about all things accessibility. It's a great resource for learning. It's not just Drupal specific. And we have a YouTube channel. There's like maybe 60 videos up there. Great resource for accessibility. Canopy sponsors my time. They design, build, support websites for clients who want to make a positive impact. I'm not going to make you all introduce yourselves, but I figure there's developers in here. Are there developers? Okay. Are there human resource folks? Good. Um, are there marketers? Salespeople? Designers? Okay. So we're everybody. We're, we can be content entry people. Um, basically, we're anyone who gives a damn about accessibility, right? Yeah. <laughs> What are we going to talk about today? So I do want to throw in some terms and definitions, and I'm going to kind of breeze through those because you can find those on the internet, but I do want to give like a kind of high surface level of those, but I don't want to take a whole lot of time because there's so much information after that. Um, talk about standards, guidelines, talk about what assistive technology actually is, and then the media we're going to talk about are images, slideshows, videos, players, and social media, which some folks don't always think about, but it is a source of media and it does need to be accessible. So how do we embrace accessibility? We have to first understand what it means, right? So in the context I'm gonna talk about today, it's about producing rich, engaging content that's accessible to everyone. We don't wanna make it different, we wanna make it accessible to everyone. This is one of my favorite quotes. Um, Temple Grandin is a life, animal life science professor at Colorado State University, and she's sort of one of the first people on the autistic spectrum to be a spokesperson. And she always says that the differences aren't quantifiable, and this is the quote I like, I'm different, not less. Because we all think a little bit different, it doesn't make us less of a person. And why do we design for accessibility? Well, first off, it's the law, right? Um, but we also want to include a wider consumer base for our products and services. We want to make sure that we don't exclude people from using our products and services. Uh, accessibility is absolutely essential for folks that want to create high quality websites and tools. Um, according to the Center for Disease Control, 26% of people living in the United States live with a disability, and that number is higher in other nations. So if we think about 26% of people, that's almost one in four, that makes 61 million people who live with a disability in the United States. And remember, as we get older, our eyesight deteriorates, we have hearing loss, we're not as agile as we used to be, um, there's situational disabilities. Recently, I had a broken arm and a broken collarbone, and like the whole mouse thing was kind of weird. It didn't last very long. It was situational. Well, that was temporary. But then there's the, dis there's the situational disabilities where you have the mom on the bus, and she doesn't have her headphones, and she wants to watch a YouTube video, or you have someone who has limited dexterity on their cell phone. Um, and then we have to think about um, the disabilities we can't see. There's fatigue. 
there's dis uh, debilitating pain, dizziness, cognitive dysfunctions, learning differences. Um, and not that this is a disability, but English as a native language is a privilege. So that can be kind of lumped into why we want to make things more accessible. Webby did a study a few years back and tested uh, 62 large universities, one from every state and one from every territory, uh, to search for common accessibility problems on their page. And they found 78% um, had obvious problems. So that's just the obvious problems. Um, by 2018, the number went up quite a bit, but there's like so much room for improvement. And being accessible means everyone. It means we need to make sure that everyone can readily access whatever we're offering. Services, venues, and content. Inclusion isn't about special privileges, it's about lowering the barriers. It's about creating the same experience for everyone. So I just wanna say that inclusion isn't about special privileges. Okay, like I said, I'm just gonna kind of breeze through these. Um, there's the ADA, which is the American Disabilities Act. It prohibits discrimination and guarantees that people who live with disabilities have the same opportunity as everyone else to participate in mainstream American life um, and to participate in state and local government programs and services. We hear a lot about 508. 508 is more federal, but it requires federal agencies to develop, procure, maintain, and use information and communications technology that is accessible for everyone, whether or not they work in the federal government or not. And we're talking administrative users too. So not just end users, people who are entering content in those sites. POR is a, an acronym for the four high-level principles that describe accessibility. So the first one's perceivable. Perceivable means that the user can identify content and interface elements by means of the senses. So the information and the user information must be presentable in ways that the user can perceive. There's operable. It means that the user can successfully use the controls, the buttons, the navigations, and any other necessary things to get around on the website. Um, we want to make sure that all the user interface and navigations are operable. So this means um, making sure that people who use keyboards, you know, that there's keyboard, uh, the functionality is available from a keyboard, um, that we give users enough time to process the information and input input what they need. Um, we don't want to use content that might create seizures for some or physical reactions for some of our folks. And operable also means making it easier for other ways besides the keyboard too because there's a there's a plethora of things so there's not just the keyboard so we want to make sure our websites are operable. Understandable it means the information and the operation of the user interface must be understandable. So we make our text readable and understandable. So this is more content based. And some of this is designed to, you know, text fonts and line heights and that sort of thing. Um, we want to make sure our content appears in predictable ways that the, for people who are familiar with pages, it's laid out sort of consistently across your pages. Um, and when it's understandable, it helps our users um, correct and avoid mistakes. So, robust. I'm sorry, but can people in the back see these slides? Okay. Um, users should um, choose the technology. They should be able to choose whatever technology they want to interact with the website. They shouldn't have to just use a mouse to navigate on your website. Um, they should be able to interact with online documents, the multimedia, and any other information, PDFs. The content has to be robust enough to be interpreted by a lot of user agents, um, and that includes assistive technology. And also, part of the robust uh, guideline is that we wanna make sure that we maximize the compatibility 
for future tools too, because accessibility is a moving target, so we're always thinking about what's coming up next. WCAG, anyone say it different than that? WCAG. WCAG, okay, so Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. Basically, there's some levels of compliance. Um, we strive for the AA level um, for most higher eds and federal claims. Uh, a is the lowest level. If you're AA compliant, you're also A compliant. If you're AAA compliant, you're also AA and A compliant. AAA is really hard to get. Craigslist used to be that way, but now that they look at content and the users break the websites, Craigslist is no longer AAA, but it's a super hard category to get to. But this is sort of what we strive for. Um, and who uses these guidelines? Um, web content developers, page authors, site designers, the people who design and um, author our tools, uh, the web accessibility evaluation tool developers, they follow those guidelines. And basically, it's a guideline for anyone who wants one. So it's a, it's a set of standards that's agreed upon in the community. Assistive technology is any device software or equipment that helps people around the challenges um, so they can learn, communicate, and function better. So that can be screen readers, it can be speech input devices, it can be pointers, it could be keyboards. A mobile phone can be assistive technology. Okay, so I'm gonna break it down. We wanna make sure that we accommodate visual needs, so we wanna make sure things are easy to see. We want to make sure that we accommodate motor needs, so we make things easy to interact with. Auditory needs, we want to make sure that it's easy to hear. And then cognitive needs, we want to make sure that folks understand what our content is. We want to make the experience as equivalent regardless of what we cannot control. There's a lot of things we can't control. Um, there's you know, you go to the beach and you have the high contrast and now you can't see the information on your phone. So just there's a whole bunch of different situations you have to think about for accessibility. Screen readers, simply put, they put the, they take the text and convert it into speech. It allows um, folks who live with low vision and sometimes cognitive and learning disabilities to access information that they couldn't otherwise access. And it also maintains a level of privacy for them. No longer does someone have to read the information, open their emails and read it. So it's really important for privacy. Um, and it removes a barrier to the internet or digital information. Another little stat that um, WebAIM did a survey to determine how and why users use screen readers. And they found that 87.6 people who use a screen reader, they do it because they live with a disability. And of those 87%, 71% rely on the audio alone. So that's important to think about. It's the audio alone. Other people use screen readers, you know, but that's the main stat. Screen readers, um, they navigate by tables, lists, buttons, forms, all kinds of things on the website. Developers who want to know how the content sounds on the screen readers should work with native screen reader users because as a developer, we take, tr we take shortcuts and we don't always have it the same. Um, we want to make sure that we use landmarks and page regions and use appropriate HTML and semantic markup. We want to make sure that we give folks options to skip navigation links. And then we want to make sure if we have forms and links that they're clearly labeled. And I'm going to go into all this stuff a little bit more. Images. So why do we love images? Because images enhance our content, you know, especially for people who live with cognitive and learning disabilities. We include images and media to support and add to our content, sort of supporting that text on our screen. Um, and then people who live with low vision um, use images as cues to help orient themselves on the page too. And of course, in media, images lead to higher conversions. There's a higher click-through rate when you have a uh, picture attached to your your images so you have a better return on your investment. But images can be barriers when they're not accessible. 
Um, accessible images uh, benefit people who use screen readers. The text alternatives can um, be read aloud or rendered as braille if they have a braille reader. Um, people who use speech input software, they can put the focus on a button or a linked image with a single voice command. Uh, the text alternative can be read aloud for people browsing speech-enabled websites. Um, mobile web users, images can be turned off, uh, especially like if you're in, in like where I live rurally and your data gets eaten up, you turn your images off. So without those alt images, I don't know what's going on on the page. Um, and then alt images also create value for search engine optimizations because now the images are indexable because there's words. And I'm going to breeze through these because I'm going to talk each, about each one of these specifically. Um, there's a simple image that conveys simple information like a photograph or an icon. Complex images, charts, graphs, diagrams. Decorative images. Those are images that are purely decorative, but not informative. But I have more to say about that. Um, images of text, that's where you have a picture of text. There's groups of images where you have one image, but it conveys the information for the entire group. And then there's image maps that contain multiple clickable areas, like a park map, that kind of thing. So the simple image, this is just a Volkswagen van, you know, it's out of at a, at a bug show and they're showing off that they have an original tire and original gas cap, you know, so it's pretty cool. Um, but these are, it's simple information. And even if it's simple, it needs to be described with alternative text. So the alternative text on these kind of images are sort of short and sweet. It's typically invisible to people who don't, um, who can see the image. So if you can see the image, typically you can't see the alt text or hear the alt text. It's exposed when people use assistive technology such as the screen readers in Braille. The description should convey the content and functionality of the image as concisely as possible. You don't want a rambling book. You want to make sure it's short, sweet, succinct. It's a simple image. Complex images. I don't know why you would ever have that on your website, but if you do, that's a complex image. They can be graphs, charts, diagrams, anything that contains too much information to be effectively described by your alt text. So what do we do for these? We describe them with a the long image, or we describe them within the context of our text. We use the, we use the image to support the text around it. The question is, given the current context, what information is this image intended to communicate? Chaos. <laughs> so a long description should include any structural elements too. So if you have a table or a graph, make sure that you label the table and the graph so they know what they're looking at. Data tables, headings, lists. Okay, so I have lots of words about decorative images. I'll read the standard of what people think of decorative images. If an image is purely decorative and does not convey meaning, then there are several ways to ignore the image. Um, you know, doing the two quotes, leaving a space, there's ways to ignore the image. And I can see that in certain cases where the styling, like is a border or, um, and it's not uh, contributing any information and identified and described by the surrounding text. But if we use decorative images to convey mood, mm -hmm. you are leaving your consumers behind. If someone looks at your, at your blog and there's this beautiful image and it's red and it evokes this warm feeling they're missing out on that experience. They're not gonna like that article as, someone, as much as someone who can see that image. So my thought is, if you have an image that conveys mood, convey that mood in your alt text. Because we want to make the experience as, as equivalent as possible. Images of text, that's where uh, it's 
the text is presented within the image. If the image is not a logo, avoid doing this. Um, but if you do need to put an image of text in your image, um, make sure that the text alternative contains the exact same language. Um, but using text in your images isn't always a good best practice because when people start <coughs> zooming in and out, the text can become blurry and distorted and not able to read anymore. So um, again, if there's a situation where you can't avoid an image of a text, make sure the alt alternative is exactly the same. For groups of images, um, if the multiple images convey one piece of information, the text alternative for one image should convey the information for all of the images. So this is a group of five stars, but say you had a four and a half star rating, that first star you would say um, rating four out of five stars, and then the rest of them would be empty. Because as a screen reader, they would read all of those stars, and it's just more clear just to, to convey the single information in the, in the first. Image maps, they're where you have multiple clickable things. So you've got links and you've got um, help text. Uh, the text alternative for an image that contains multiple clickable areas should provide overall context for the whole set of links as well. So individual clickable areas should have alternative text that describes the purpose and destination of the link as well. So. You have a link here, you want to make sure guest Presidio San Francisco, but you also want to have a tag that says where this where this person is navigating to after. So having link text. And remember images can be pagination, anchor links, logos, decoration, help people with orientation on their page. For alt text, context is super important. We want to make sure that we're accurate and equivalent in presenting the same content and function of the image. Again, be succinct. Typically, no more than a few words are necessary, though sometimes a short sentence or two might do. Um, don't use phrases that start with image of or graphic of, because chances are the people know they're already on an image, so that would be redundant information, and sometimes just depending on how the screen reader reads it, would be image of, image of. So um, be succinct. And don't be redundant or provide the same information that's around the image as well, because that's redundant and that can be cumbersome for someone that just read the article and then they're reading it again um, through the image. Think about it this way, because I live rural. If you can turn off the images and style sheets and relay all of the information, then you're in a good space. Can your CSS and all that stuff be turned off and people be able to access all the same information? So go into your Google tools, turn off your, off your CSS and images and your JavaScript and see if you can get to all that information. <laughs> Slideshows. They're kind of nice, right? I don't know. They're <laughs> um, they are popular, and lots of times they're predominantly placed on the page. They're tickers. They're picture galleries. They're a bunch of stuff you can't get to. Um, Slideshows display one item at a time. They're also known as carousels or sliders. Um, again, they're news headlines, they're tickers, they're featured articles, image galleries. Uh, they're kind of your call to actions on your page sometimes. But according to W3 schools, slideshows are disputed from a usability perspective because their content is hard to discover. So even W3 school says, the first rule of slideshows is not to use slideshows. But how do we make a slideshow more accessible? Because you're going to have a client, you're going to have a product owner that wants one. So we style the carousel to make sure it's usable and readable by everyone. We use, um, well, if we use transitions, which we probably shouldn't, but if you use transitions, make sure that the folks accessing the content are able to turn it on and off. Uh, 
and then resume to um, provide the ability to turn it off completely. Provide visual controls um, that are accessible to the keyboard, mouse, and touch. Um, be sure that those elements are highlighted on focus. Highlighted on focus means that people are tabbing through or using some sort of assistive technology and they need to know where they are on the page. So it's visible on focus. And ensure that there's no keyboard traps. So they're going into your slideshow and they tab in. Make sure that they can get out of your slideshow too. There's one of the quickest ways you can lose your consumers is when they can get into an element but they can't get out. So back to those controls. Um, Make sure your controls are visible. Remember that size and color. So probably when this was designed, there was a different image behind it, but you can barely see the controls here. So you need to be aware, if you have it as a background image, that your background image is always changing. It might not be pretty, but having your controls on the outside of the background really helps with accessibility. Um, and then size and color really matter too. You know, how big are the controls? And, you know, can someone who uh, has a, a palsy, can they, can they get to your controls? Ensure that there's an alternative to your slideshow. It does not have to be exactly the same, but it should have most of the information. It doesn't, your slideshow does not need to function if your style sheets are, are turned off, but the information still has to be available. So again, if you turn off your images and turn off your CSS, can you find the same content? Always remember that, turning off those things that people don't always have access to. And let's look at videos. Um, there's a couple different things to think about, how we're consuming videos, and then how's your audience consuming videos. Captions are text versions of audio contents synchronized with the video. Um, there are tons of situations that benefit from captions. There's loud environments at the airport where you can't hear, so you, you read along with the, the captioning. There's silent co-working spaces where you want the headphones <coughs> on, where you don't have your headphones and want the captions on. There's the noisy co-working environments that you want the captions on. Um, for some folks, it's easier and quicker to read the text. They'll have it on quick play and then they'll, it's easier for them to process the information and have it at one and a half speed. Um, content can be used without needing to download files, for example, to save data on mobile. So if you have the captioning on, they don't have to download the transcripts to get the same information. Um, and on the on captionings, make sure they're accurate. If they're a great idea to have accurate, but some like federal and higher ed education websites require that they're accurate. And I think Mike Anello, I don't know if he announced it, but Google Slides has this really neat thing where you can enable closed captioning and it's on the fly. It's not oh, the best because look how little it is. And it's really captioning, and, but it's a lot better than nothing. Captioning. <laughs> but it's a good tool, like say, say your, your shop works with somebody overseas and their native language is in English and that helps support by, by having some text for them to read. But I'm gonna turn it off because it's really small and it interferes with the captions that YouTube puts on. Um, captions can also include other audio content as well. Um, dogs barking, music singing, lightning striking, um, anything that adds value to your story and information. And then captions can be either opened or closed. Closed captions can be turned on and off. Open captioning is always on. The caveat to open captioning is they're not always editable. Closed captioning you can go and, and edit afterward, but um, lots of folks like the open captions just because it's on there, it's once, and it's done with. Um, let's see. Audio descriptions. They are separate narrative audio, audio tracks that describe important visual information so people can't see what's going on the screen. It helps support 
um, you know, women dancing, women getting married, dogs running across the field. It supports all that information that they couldn't see on the screen. And transcripts are the text version of the media content. And a transcript should capture spoken audio, any on-screen text, someone's driving by, they're reading a book and there's some text, um, and descriptions of any key visual information that wouldn't otherwise be visible without seeing the video. Um, transcripts are an important way of making our multimedia accessible. They allow anyone that cannot access content from web, audio, or video to read a transcript instead or have the transcript read to them. They don't have to be word for word, but they should contain all those extra informations that add to the story, the dog barking, the lightning striking, the woman dancing. Um, users of screen readers often and well, most I've read about and encountered in real life prefer having transcripts because they set the read rate really fast and they can go through the information way faster. Um, and then, once we have a text version of the audio or of the media, now it's search engine optimization <coughs> again. So you're creating value, people are coming to your website, keywords. Sure. You say again, it doesn't have to be word for word. It so doesn't if someone have to be word for word. Has um uh, in there, you can. Mm -hmm. Yep. And that's actually better when you omit it because it's distracting for readers, and some readers will actually pull and not finish the content with that sort of things. Just real quick before you move on, you said that the the slides captioning messes with the YouTube captioning. Yeah, so what happens is the slides are down here at the bot, the, the caption is down here at the bottom, and then when it goes on YouTube, it kind of covers part of it up. Okay. So the YouTube captioning kind of goes on top because you can't disable the, <coughs> this because it's on the recording. So choosing an accessible video player, good luck. <laughs> um, <laughs> and the <laughs> It's about what you're trying to do. How are you delivering your message? Um, there's important things to consider to make something fully accessible. Um, does the player support closed captioning? Does the media player support audio description in a way that enables users to toggle on and off the buttons? Can the media player's buttons and controls be operated without a mouse? Can they get to, are they highlighted on focus? Um, can the users of assistive technology distinguish between the controls? Are they labeled appropriately? And can, can your media player be used across all devices and browsers? That's a tricky one. JAWS uses uh, IE still. So, you know, as much as we all don't want to develop for that, most screen reader users are using that. So just be careful to make sure that you, all your accessibility features run across browsers and platforms. Are the major video providers like Vimeo and YouTube, are they free accessible? Like no. No. <laughs> um, so some of them are, but it's like they have like weird, Nothing's turned on by default. You have to like, like dig I know into they the system. Right. Really before, but I didn't know how they work with the buttons and that sort of thing. If, they, if their players were compatible with the keyboards and all that. Uh, not, I think not all of them out of the box, and that that's why in Drupal we have modules that help us with those, like the able player and right. things like that. So, um, and it also has to do with the CSS that your folks design around your player. So, but you know, YouTube, some of their buttons are in the in the yeah. player, and that's not accessible. Do you have any opinions on uh, like ambient video, so a video that doesn't have like dialogues but text, like so when like a page loads and there's something that feels like a, like an animated gift kind of thing? How does it make you? What was that? How does it make you feel? <laughs> <laughs> Those are yeah, tricky. That, that's actually what I was going to ask. If it's similar to if it impacts the mood of the page, mm -hmm. there's to be some way to And and it, sometimes it comes across as cheesy when you're trying to describe mood. You know, it's a hard balance. You know, but I'm like one of those like. I just want everyone to be able to access, like, have the same experience. 
what is the right way to, it, it's almost like providing an alt for a video. How are you actually supposed to do that? Say again? So for a video, if you wanted to describe the mood of it, mm -hmm. like it doesn't actually have captioning, how would you do that? Describe the mood of a video? Yeah. Well, is it sound or visual? Visual. So you can describe the warm tones. You can describe the babbling brook. You can use words. You can use your adjectives. You know what I mean? Like, how does that make you feel? And you list out all those adjectives, and then you use those when you're doing your, your transcripts. Okay. So, like I said, it's tricky. Yeah. That's why lots of people say don't do it. Um, let's see, forms. I'm just going to kind of blow through these. Forms can be visually and cognitively complex for everyone to use. Um, so everyone benefits when our forms are more accessible. People who live with cognitive dysfunctions, people who live with, who use speech input devices, people with limited dexterity, and people using screen readers. So the W3 school says to make a form accessible, we need to make sure that we label controls. So we provide labels on all the form controls, all the text fields, all the check boxes, all the radio boxes, and all the drop down menus on everything. Everything has a form control. Group related controls together. So people can kind of navigate easy, like if you have a whole series of radio boxes, try to stick those together and then have your fill in long answers on a different form. Provide form instructions and help text that really helps users navigate and, use, and complete the form. And when you're providing um, instructions, In addition to providing instructions, make sure when someone completes the form that we know that we let them know and validate their answer so they know that they've completed the form. And provide feedback and inline errors when there's errors on the page. We don't want the user to have to like try to find that error in in a required field. Sometimes it's helpful to break up your forms into multi-page forms. It makes it more digestible. So, I love going to concerts. I love going to concerts that are popular. It drives me nuts because I'm sitting there and I'm waiting and it's 10.01 and I push the button to get the Grateful Dead ticket and I have six minutes and crap, my wallet's upstairs. And that's me being an able-bodied person. So if you do have a form, please have the option to turn that timer off. Some people, can't complete those forms in time. You were taking away their experience. My brother's quadriplegic. He could never complete his form on time, never. You know, and so like, he didn't get front row Grateful Dead tickets. He had to sit in the, on the lawn. You know, it, that makes his experience really cruddy. Um, of course, like there are those time limits, like the concert tickets and like the auctions and things like that. But if you don't have to have that timer on for the password, allow the user to turn that timer off. It's just nice. Um, I have a few minutes longer, so I'm going to talk about social media because that's what people use now. Um, that's how our younger consumers are accessing our information. Um, higher ed. It's a big one. So another web I use study, 88% um, of people who use screen readers on a mobile phone found that only 54% of social media was somewhat accessible. Those are pretty low numbers. Um, this is just a slide with numbers. Um, a few years ago, uh, they found 200 colleges faced federal civil rights investigations. Um, and the whole idea is if your consumers are using social media, you need to make sure your social media is access accessible. It's not just your website anymore. It's your Twitter. It's your Facebook. It's everything. Everywhere your content is going out needs to be accessible. Hashtags. You know, we like hashtags. Um, 
try to use capital letters to break up your hashtags, you know, capital I, capital L, capital T for I love Twitter. Because when we do search results, all lowercase and with the camel case produce the same results. But <coughs> this can model clarity and a screen reader will read it all as one. So some people won't understand that that's I love Twitter. So use that camel, title camel case. It's just a couple of extra keystrokes. It comes down to readability. Um, but with saying that, if your hashtag is short, sure, leave it as one word. Is that a good um, practice also for like URLs as well? I don't have the answer to that. Okay. I know that you should do URL aliases for a really long, like, you know, like try to shorten it with a bit.ly link and that kind of thing. I would say yes, because when we do the ally talks and we do the bit.ly link, we title case, you know, title camel case our links just so people can remember it more too. Well, there's a difference, bit.ly actually case sensitive matters. Right, but when you can you can create your own bit.ly link yeah. and modify it, yeah. so. But, but as far as URLs are concerned or, or that, because I notice on some screen readers when we try to read the URLs, it'll, it'll read dashes, and so it's, it can get a little annoying if there's like, you know, I dash love dash Twitter dash. You know. Right. Um, our images should also create, have alt text on them. And this is kind of funky. You actually have to dig into the accessibility settings on those platforms to find and turn on those alt text images. So Twitter, you get like 144 characters, but the alt text, you get like 290. That's something to keep in mind if you have a little bit more information you want to share. The alt text is longer than the actual, uh, <coughs> actual uh, Twitter. And of course, be mindful of retweeting information. Um, that's not accessible. So anyway, so this is one I came up with when I was looking for hashtags. There's like this big thing, the whole internet blew up because everyone thought share was dead because now, now that share is dead, but no, Margaret Thatcher died. So you see it's, some people will read it one way and other people will read it another. Emoticons. I'm not a fan, but you know who loves emoticons? Screen readers. Screen readers. And they will read absolutely every one of your emoticons in line, in your email subject lines, in your handles, in your Slack names, everywhere. They can be cumbersome and they can be problematic without context. So this is a good one. Therapist. That doesn't always look like therapist. <laughs> but you can see, like if we were to read this with a screen reader, it would read the text and every time an emoticon would come up, it would break up that text. So depending on how many emoticons you have, some people will just leave. They won't get to the end. So if you want to have a hashtag, if you want to have emoticons, save them to the end. That way you people aren't leaving before the information is uh, presented. Um, this is a UCSF slide, but um, set up style guides. Um, make sure you use the pattern libraries developed. Make sure your designers are, are um, sensitive to accessibility. Make sure our WYSIWYGs have tool tips and um, things that help our content editors out with accessibility because you can have all the accessible code in the world, but when then your content goes in and breaks, it's no longer an accessible website. And rem remember that accessibility is a moving target. So it might be accessible today, but it might not be accessible two weeks from now. So always do a little bit of work on that. Um, I'm not going to go through these, but what I have like, um, I have one minute. So what I want to do is I want to do a quick tooling because it's just so much fun, and I just. So geocaching, I don't know if you know what geocaching is, it's a really fun game online. So this is a very inaccessible website. You cannot turn off this video. So people who have motion sickness, they've already left the page. So when I hit my tab key, nothing happens. I don't know where I am on the page. Oh, there I am. So as you tab your page, you need to make sure you have that visible focus. 
And then I just want to show one quick tool, which is kind of cool. We know about Site Improve, which is a pay for service. Well, they also have a free browser plugin. And the reason I like this free browser plugin is, well, back up a little bit. We should all know that automated testing tools only capture 30 to 35% of errors. 30 to 35% of errors. The rest of them we need to catch ourselves. The Site Improve tool will tell you when there's an error, but it will, that's a little, a bang, but here's an eyeball, and it asks, should you look at these images? So it also will go through and show you what, tell you which images you should look at. So it'll give you a list of the images that you should look at and see are they decorative. So it's a really handy tool. It doesn't do the test of time where it, because that's one of the things about Site Improve, you get the number of the, before, you te before you fix your site and after, so that's a little bit of a caveat, but that's a super cool tool. And then one more tool I really like, but it breaks Chrome, is the Totally, totally tool, which, okay, it is broken on my site. Um, but there's also like Color Contrast Analyzer, and this is fun, so you can test color contrast. Oh, because it's on my screen, sorry. So what you can do is test, you can grab a, your foreground color, and then you can grab and it'll tell you where your color compliance hits. So a couple of neat tools to help with accessibility, quick wins, but. What was that last one called? Color contrast with the, with a U. It's all British. Yeah. So I think that's it. I'm out of time. So questions? Early on you talked about landmarks. What do you mean by the landmarks? Landmarks are your regions, basically, so. Semantic HTML. Yeah. Like um, header, header, yeah. Color, size. So, okay. if you run the wave tool, they'll tell you where your landmarks are. You know, it's the how you break up your content. You know, so um, I learned this from Mark yesterday. Is when you have component-based layout, sometimes your uh, that will break your website a little bit because of the layout and mixing everything up a little bit. So we really have to be careful about. Um, how we mark our stuff up and do it in an order that makes sense because remember they read it according to the, the order you know not the order on the page but the order it's landmarked so 